all for coming to hear us talk about our work. I want to thank my fellow um, fellows for creating such an incredibly supportive and warm community here in Munich. And I also want to thank some Carson Center people, especially Christoph Malk, Ariel Helmick, Katie Ridson, Lena Hengel, and Daniel Dumas for not only bringing me here, but also for allowing my family to basically function uh, on a daily life here in Munich. It's been an incredible um, opportunity so far, and I really appreciate um, being back here. What I want to do today is discuss three aspects of a very new book project. Um, I'm going to first explain the origin of the project, and then I'm going to give a brief overview of the book as planned. And it's a book that I'm co-writing with Cindy Ott. Um, Cindy is the uh, outgoing president of the RCC Alumni Association, so many of you might be familiar with her. And then lastly, I'm going to try a group exercise. It hasn't been done before in the lunchtime colloquiums that I've seen, so I'm a little nervous about it going or not. But it, it, it'll illustrate what I'm trying, what we're trying to do in the book. Um, so hopefully, you will all uh, jump in enthusiastically during the last eight minutes or so of the talk, so we can try to look at some images. <clears throat> so fingers crossed. Um, let's begin with the origin of the project. Um, the origin of the project really began um, from an eight-year stint that I had as the graphics editor for the journal Environmental History, which is the journal of the American Society for Environmental History. And Cindy Ott was uh, a co-graphics editor for five of those years. And the origin of the project really stems from an email that Cindy and I had to send out dozens of times, it seemed, to contributors who were submitting essays to this section of the journal, which was called the gallery section. And it's a special section of the journal that publishes very short essays, five to eight pages long, that discuss images. Um, and over the years, Cindy and I realized we had to send out the same email over and over and over again. And here's what the email said. Dear contributor, Thank you very much for your submission to the gallery section of environmental history. We very much enjoyed your essays about, and here are examples of gallery essays, the Impressionist paintings of Claude Monet, 18th century maps of South Carolina, political cartoons from the 1970s oil crisis, postcards from the Grand Canyon, Advertisements for macaroni. Illustrations from children's books. Scientific data on climate change. And even environmental nudes from the early 20th century. And then we ended the email always by saying, but you neglect to actually analyze the images. Instead, you use your images to illustrate an argument that you make with other historical sources. Please revise and resubmit. <laughs> dozens and dozens of times. So what these authors were doing, and what we all do often, is we were using textual sources to make an argument. We were looking at newspapers, government documents, even maybe uh, personal diaries. And then we were pasting an image in that supported the argument, made with textual sources which suggested to both Cindy and myself that we have an image problem. We have an image problem within the field of the environmental humanities, which is sort of strange because images have been central to how humans understand nature forever. Um, the Lascaux cave paintings drawn 17,000 years ago to a selfie with an iPhone taken yesterday in the English garden Images are constantly used to both express our relationship with and ideas about the natural world. So images both reflect the human nature relationship and also help to transform that relationship. But it seemed from our experiences as graphics editor that environmental humanists were not using images to their full potential. We tend to treat images as passive pictures that depict facts. And we look for those facts and then use those facts. Or we use them to illustrate arguments that we make with other historical textual sources that we think of as more reliable. 
were confused about how to use images analytically as sources in their own right and also for our teaching, for teaching tools for students. So Cindy and I thought one possible solution, one way to try to help this, this problem would be to write a textbook, a very, very short textbook, in a sense, um, a how-to manual for reading images, um, sort of a, a manual that might have a top 10 tips for how to read um, images. Our tentative title is Seeing Nature, an Environmental Humanities Field Guide to Visual Culture. And the goal of the book is really quite simple, to provide practical tools for interpreting images. And I want to stress the term practical. Okay? Neither Cindy nor I are experts in the field of visual culture. We've read up on it, we've gotten up to speed on it, but really the knowledge that we have is from our experiences as editors and our own experiences trying to think and use images. Um, so this is very much on-the-job knowledge that we're trying to um, share. The audience is environmental humanists and their students. Um, and many of the images that we're going to use in the book are U.S. or Western based. And that's because that is our field. We're both Americanists. Um, but the tools, the tips, the, the, the um, techniques that we're trying to explain to people are transferable to other cultures. As long as the person doing the reading is familiar with those other cultures. Um, so just want to lay that out uh, uh, early on as well. And then the format of the book, it's really 10 short chapters, 15 to 20 pages, probably 20 pages in length, that each describe a technique or tip for analyzing visual culture. Each chapter will also include um, uh, an, an essay that shows the tip being um, done correctly. We take those essays from the gallery section, uh, successful gallery essays that we published. Um, and then also at the end, a ped pedagogical exercise that the reader can use to hone their own skills in, in reading uh, visual culture or use with their students to get their students to think more deeply about visual culture. So 10 chapters each with those aspects. Um, and I want to go through these chapters now very, very quickly. And um, this is really rudimentary, sort of sprinting through them, um, but I think we can have a deeper discussion during the Q&A um, uh, if necessary. Chapter one, analyze, don't illustrate. Do not use images as window dressing to illustrate arguments made with other sources. Instead, read the images analytically as you would read a textual source. Chapter two. Read compositional elements. This is basically asking us to think more like art historians. Think more critically about elements such as color, scale, spatial relationships, and perspectives. Chapter three, no aesthetic traditions. This is asking you to learn about how your image was created, the history of that medium at the time it was created. This entails familiarizing yourself with printmaking, perhaps, painting, cartography, depending on the image that you're trying to assess. Connect the natural and the cultural. Nature and culture are the essential relationship to, to environmental humanist study. We are encouraging people to think more critically, more consciously about that relationship when they look at an image. So for instance, look, at, look for cultural cues in seemingly natural objects. In a painting of a forest, is the forest wild or has it been planted? You might be able to tell that and it will change the meaning of that image. And conversely, look for the natural in cultural objects. If you have a photograph of a dining room table, knowing or trying to figure out what kind of wood that table is made from may influence the meaning um, of that, that image. Chapter five is the basic historicize and contextualize. Basically, you must know the history of the time period during which the image was produced to understand both its production, both, but also its reception by an audience. Six, compare across time and space. This is really for moments when we want to compare and contrast images, more than one image. Uh, many historians are um, familiar with using two images from different time periods of the same place to track change over time, right? But what we do less often is we look at 
two images of different places taken at the same moment to look for cultural differences and cultural similarities. So for instance, if you had an image of a playground in New York City in 1985 and an image of a playground in Munich in 1985, you could read those two images for cultural differences when it came to attitudes towards children and play, for instance. And with two young children in Munich right now, I can tell you the playgrounds are incredibly different in really, really um, fascinating ways. Chapter 7, track the lives of the image. Did it first appear in a wealthy person's home and then make its way to a museum? and then all of a sudden appear on an advertisement, like that macaroni advertisement we saw later. That image is a very famous painting, it turns out. Um, that journey of the image really matters to the meaning of the image at certain periods of time. Eight, oops. question scientific data. Graphs, charts, and tables are not objective truths. The scales that are being used, the time frames that the scientist has chosen, the legends and captions that describe those images, even the colors that are being used are all helping the scientist prove something. And they can be visual cues to that, that process. Question them. Nine, consider absences. What does not appear in an image is often as important as what does. How and why was the image cropped? What was left out of the frame? And then finally, remember that all visual analyses are not equal. Often, when my students finally realize that visual culture can be interpreted and is really creative, they assume that all interpretations are valid. And we want to remind readers that that is not the case. Um, some readings are more correct than others. Some are downright wrong. Um, just as one can read a census tract incorrectly, one can also read an image. Um, incorrectly as well. Okay, so there's the book. Now here comes the a little bit scary part. How much time do I have? I forgot to start my clock. Eight minutes, Eight minutes. perfect. That's what I thought. So we're now going to do a group exercise. Um, this comes from the second chapter, which is reading compositional elements. It's basically asking you to think like an art historian. What I'm going to do is I've handed out a worksheet. It lists ten compositional elements. We use this in the chapter to get people to think more broadly about all of these things. We're not going to do all of them today. We're going to look at the first three. Focal point, which asks us to think about where our eyes first land on an image. Direction of movement, which asks you to think about where your eyes then go. And finally, spatial relationships, which asks you to look for spatial divisions within images. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you first through a very, very um, well-known painting to just so you can get an idea of how these three things might work. And then after that, we're going to look at a very ordinary, everyday image, someone's personal photograph, a snapshot. And together, we're going to try to do a, a reading of the image. Are you all game? All right, good. Okay, here it is. Westward, the course of empire makes its way. Emmanuel Lutz. You all have it on the back of the sheet, if you turn it over, if you can't really see it here. Okay, this is an enormous painting. It's 20 feet by 30 feet. It hangs in the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's really, um, its symbolism is incredibly overt. It is basically a visual allegory. It was painted to be read and, 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 and read for, for cues and clues. So let's think about the focal point. Um, most people, when they see this image, their uh, eyes direct and focus on the center of the painting. Number one, it's in the center. Number two, the bright dress that the woman is wearing draw the eyes as well. There's also this rocky stage upon which the action is taking place. And that action involves a family. We see a mother, a baby, another child, and the father. Direction of movement. Where do we move next? Most viewers will follow the father's outstretched arm, along with the gazes of several of the other actors in the painting, to this landscape on the left. 
this landscape, where am I, sorry, it's empty, it's expansive, it's brightly colored, and that orange and, le and yellow hues in the 1860s were a visual trope for the divine, holy, and God. Spatial relationships, how does this image get divided up? The empty landscape on the left is contrasted with the mountains on the right. This is where the settlers came from. We see their wagon train below. It's what they passed through. The mountains are dark, cold, and dangerous, and that danger is illustrated in the cross here and the burial scene going on as well. So we've looked at three elements. Let's throw out some arguments here. This painting can be read as a celebration of westward migration, and that migration is depicted as a family enterprise through dark, dangerous, unholy wilderness into an uninhabited promised land. This is basically a visual narrative of America's manifest destiny. Well-known image painted for us to read in this way, sort of an easy, an easy uh, lift, right? But what about someone's personal snapshot? All we know about this image, it's untitled. It was, uh, it's of, a, of the Crow Indian Reservation. All we know is that it was taken by a Crow Indian named Bill Yellowtail. He was born in 1947, and he grew up on a ranch um, on the reservation. So what I want to do now is, if, with your help, discuss the same three elements and see where we land. Okay. So focal point, where do your eyes go? This is the part I dreaded right here. This is the part. Where do your eyes go? Seth? Do you want us to do a I don't think we have enough time, so I thought that we would just sort of go for it. Like, if you're, you know, don't think too much. Just where do your eyes go? Where do your eyes go? Uh, this man here? That guy. Yes? Good. Great. Um, why? How come? How come? It's bright, so the hat is bright, the shirt is bright, good. Central, exactly, very, very good. Cool. Sorry? He's moving, good. Which, that, which also suggests the next, the next sort of um, element, which is direction of movement, okay? Um, some people look here, some people also see this man, because he's a little bit higher up, right? But usually these two figures are the central feature. Next, direction of movement. Is that where everyone sees the movement going? Yeah. Okay. So what is it about these other people in this image that might be similar, different, important, uh, something to think about, something that might be um, some sort of... What are they doing? They're watching. They're what? They're watching. Okay, they're watching. What are they watching? It looks like the activity of the people on the left. Okay. You can't tell if they're shooting. Maybe shooting a horse, but it's also like Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something on the ground? Something on the ground here? Okay. So what about these groups? Are there similarities and differences between these men? They're all wearing hats, yep. The hats, good. Jeans, great. They're all men. They're all men. They look older, right? There's the boy on the side. So if we follow the other direction, we see a young boy, right? Maybe with his father. How much time do I have left? Um, two minutes. Perfect. What about these people? We've mentioned the similarities. They have similar dress. Yeah, their, their attention is directed towards the floor. Okay. Right here, they're directed towards the floor, right? Yeah. Is there anything else? There's, there's actually cattle in here that we, it might be hard to see. Okay. Let's discuss the spatial composition of this. In the Lutz image, it was left to right divided. How is this image divided up? Third. 
Top to bottom, right? Great. So we have this bottom area where all the action is taking place. And then we have this top area. What's up here? Sorry? The landscape. Can we, can we come to any conclusions about the photographer and what he, he, Bill Yellowtail, was trying to say in depicting it this way? He's, he's consciously delineated the two, right? The people are fenced in. The people are closed in. The, the land is very open. The land seems to be important to the photographer, though, right? It's not um, it's in the center. It's very. Um, it's also not, not at all empty. There's a road here. There's some other buildings over here. All right, so let's try to now throw out some arguments. Overall arguments. It's a scene about work. Thank you. They're, they're branding. Yeah, exactly. They're branding. It's a scene of work. They're working. He's working. Um, she is working. The lone woman. She seems to be recording something, maybe keeping track of what's going on. It's a scene of work. Good. What else? It's a scene of possession and illusion. But what do you mean by that? Explain. That's their land. Yeah. It's their land. Um, and you said inclusion. What did you mean by inclusion? Meaning that they're including the land within the landscape. Okay. Of Good. It's not, there, it's, there's the fence, but this is also it's, it's sovereign land. Yep. Good. The, the cattle are grazing out there. Exactly. It's true. It it's, it's, looks like this because cattle have grazed on it, right? Yeah. The cattle look tired and removed from their land? I mean, the, or the humans look tired. <laughs> okay. So I'll we'll try to wrap it up here. Also, if we talk about all the shared, um, the cowboy hats, the jeans, um, it's hard to see an image, but some of these individuals very much look white, and some of these individuals, it's hard to see, but their, their faces are shaded, but they also could be um, perceived as being Native American. Um, so you have a very, very um, mixed workscape here. Let me just sort of conclude here by, by talking about some of the, the arguments here. The West is not an empty land, right? It's a land that is a workscape, a living workscape, ranching, grazing going on. The land is important to those people who live and work there. The photographers put the landscape in the very center of the painting. He didn't crop it out to focus only on, on the labor going on. The work culture is very mixed. We have different ethnicities, Native Americans and whites working together. We have different genders. The woman is involved here, even though you could argue that there's a hierarchy and a division of labor here going on. You have different ages, young and old working together as well. Um, so there is this sense of a, a blended cultural workscape here um, that uh, you could make the argument is, is very different than that painting by Emmanuel Lutz that we looked at earlier. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> um, thank you very much for listening, and hopefully in the Q&A we can talk more.